I'm Nirupama Subramanian and you're watching South Asia Matters on the brand new web platform Avaaz South Asia. My guest today is Dr. Parvez Hudboy, the eminent physicist, uh, anti-nuclear weapons activist and one of Pakistan's foremost public intellectuals. We are going to discuss today his latest book Pakistan Origin, Identity and Future. Welcome to the show Dr. Hudboy. Tell me, it's a 500-page book, and it's very deeply researched, annotated. How long did it take you to write this this book? Thank you, Nirupama. You've been very kind to me. Uh, I am not that, you know, um, top kind of person that you've said I am. Huh. 500 pages uh, took about five years. I didn't work all the time on it. But yeah, you see, this is a book that I felt had to be written. It's not that I was specially qualified for it. In fact, as a nuclear physicist, a lot of people think that I should not have written such a book, left it for historians. But um, you know what? Um, our historians, Pakistani historians in particular, are not very truthful. And what one needs first and foremost is truth in history. How truth is to be decided is, of course, something that uh, is not entirely clear, because even in contemporary matters, you see that uh, people have can have very differing opinions. And when it comes to the past, it gets worse. But then you see, it just didn't require a historian. It needed a political scientist. It needed an anthropologist, a sociologist, an economist to write this kind of a book which goes from the origins deep back in the past to the present time. So my apologies for not being all of those people, but at, I suppose I could say I've tried to be truthful. But what I have read the whole book and what I uh, made out was that you brought a, a, a scientist's uh, rigor, perhaps, and discipline into investigating everything in Pakistan's history. And uh, you also say in the book that this began as, um, you know, uh, uh, your idea was basically to uh, put together some personal uh, recollections, anecdotes of growing up in Pakistan. Um, and, you know, uh, you wanted to bring all that in. And there are some anecdotes uh, in this book about uh, what you grew up to believe and how you discovered uh, as you grew up, um, as you went into your 20s, that perhaps all that was not correct. Can you talk a little bit about this process of realization? Ah, well, uh, you know, kids, especially young boys, tend to be hyper-nationalists. That's because we are brought up, first of all, with machoism as an essence. So admiring war, admiring heroes, fighters, all that. And then, of course, instruments of war like, like tanks and aircraft and ships and submarines and all that stuff. You, and then I uh, when you... Up, I, you went to sign up for the 1965 <laughs> war. I, <laughs> I mean, that you know, I was... I was so delighted that we went to war with India uh, because I say, oh, great, now we're going to see some actual fighting, you know, instead of reading about it in, uh, you know, comic books and, uh, and magazines and all that. This is going to be real life. It's going to be real fun. And uh, I remember when uh, Indian bombers flew over Karachi and the AKAC guns were, were trying to shoot them down. Oh, how thrilling it was. Uh, of course, no bomb landed in our neighborhood. Uh, that the ones have been that, that did. Yeah. <laughs> that, that wouldn't have been fun. No, no. But yeah, I went to, um, to the army recruiting center. They said, uh, we don't take boys with uh, spectacles. I had specs when I was 15 years old. So uh, then I went to the Navy office. Then I went to the Air Force and uh, they all rejected me. They, they patted my head and said, go away, come back when you're older. So uh, when did you start realizing that, you know, uh, what you'd grown up to believe was 
probably not the 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 true history of pakistan when did that process begin i think it began with uh, general principles so i started reading bertrand russell when i was um, 15 16 and um, that hit me uh, like a blow on the head so i learned from bertrand russell or, i don't know if i'm quoting him right but patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel i found that such a titillating phrase I said my god um maybe it's right um, and then i started asking myself all armies in the world are supposed to be defending their country so some army must be um on the offensive and so that kind of a logical conundrum got me into thinking more deeply about things and then um, i won a scholarship to mit i went there and soon as i landed over there i said uh, my god these americans are madmen the the students are protesting their own government for the war in vietnam and then i listened to them and then it made a lot of sense and then i joined them and then i became part of sds students for a Democ- democratic society and then i got nearly arrested and that i think and uh, then at the same time the civil war in east pakistan started out and i found myself on the opposite side of uh, pakistani students who were studying at mit and we got into furious fights well uh, that was the beginning of my politicization i said damn it i have to come back to pakistan and i have to fix things because this is such a this is a country with such enormous injustices there's poor there's rich there's uh, there's mass poverty so i've got to go back and fix it all and then i in the process became a communist and uh, right. went back to pakistan i joined the labor union and oh, lots of things so that's a very interesting journey uh, dr hudboy i you know from reading your book uh, what i got i mean as a central thesis of the book was that um the two nation theory was completely wrong in fact the creation of from that the, the creation of pakistan was wrong so that's a very radical thing to say and uh, i mean just to ask you could you could hindus and muslims have live together in one nation uh, especially given what the fears are uh, as expressed in your book about the new india well look for, that's exactly why i felt it necessary to go back 3000 years or more and look at uh, the claims of hindutva that um, there was a hindu nation thousands of years ago well looking at the evidence there was not people in the subcontinent even before the advent uh, the advent of islam identified themselves with their region their village their profession their caste in particular their parents what they did um during the day whether they were uh, farmers whether they were uh manual labor whatever so there was no identity then but uh, well um over time there as everywhere in the world you have small communities being absorbed into bigger ones and the beginnings of an identity emerging then come the muslims and they came as invaders they came as uh, marauders some simply looted and went back some state and they became they became residents they became the the people of the land themselves now the difference between hindus and muslims initially was very small in fact the muslims couldn't be dis- distinguished in their practices by as great a traveler as al biruni who i refer to very um often in the book yeah. alberuni says look uh, from his point of view the muslims living in india he calls them hindu mm-hmm. <laughs> because 
he says they don't look like us Arabs. They don't talk like us Arabs. They, uh, yeah, they they say the kalma. That's okay, but uh, their habits are those of Hindus, and they worship at Hindu shrines and temples as well. Many of them did, and there was a lot of syncretism then. It became even more syncretic during uh, during the era of uh, Akbar, Akbar Yazam, Akbar the Great, as he's called, whatever. And uh, well, that was remarkable because um, Akbar was uh, Muslim. Uh, so were, of course, all the Mughals, but they married into Hindu families, into the Rajputs in particular. And, uh, you know, the differences were always there, sure. But there were differences within Muslims as well, between Sunnis and Shias, which were incredibly bloody. In fact, bloodier, much bloodier than between uh, Muslims and Hindus. So, look, for a long time, Muslims and Hindus had lived together in peace. And now if you're asking me whether this would have continued, well, uh, it's a hypothetical question, but we can examine that in later, and that's what I do in my book. And I also look at how the British uh, essentially exacerbated the differences. That's right. Uh you know, are you also in, in this book, which is full of many, many uh, radical uh, ideas and uh, um, conclusions, uh, you also take on some of the uh, uh, found what you call the founder heroes of, of Pakistan, the idea of Pakistan. Uh, one of them is Sir Syed Ahmed Khan. The other is uh, Muhammad Iqbal. And the third is, of course, Jinnah. And uh, you have a very, um, uh, you know, very incisive, uh, let me call it that, comparison between Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan and uh, Muhammad Iqbal. Uh, would you like to speak about that a bit for our viewers? Yeah, I uh, think that Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, in fact, all three of Pakistan's heroes have been essentially misrepresented in Pakistani textbooks and even in the writings of Pakistani historians. If you look at their lives and you look at them in some detail, you find that they're indeed very, very different. So take Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan. He's celebrated as the founder of the two-nation theory, which has... A measure of truth, after all, you know, when you um, make somebody, uh, you, you pin the hero's label onto someone, there has to be a measure of truth, and there is. But Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan's journey was incredible. He ended up as a communalist, and uh, uh, in the last stages of his life, he was uh, talking of two nations, but he had his notion of two nations was not that of either uh, Iqbal or of Jinnah, who came much later. What's hidden from Pakistanis, all of them, I'd say, is the, is the incredible radicalism in Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan's thinking. He was a modernist. He said uh, traditional Islam is leading us into a dead end. We need to revisit what is written in the Quran. We need to make Islam and science consistent with each other. We need to get rid of all this baggage of miracles. And he said, uh, these miracles didn't really happen. They were imagined. They were symbolic. They were um, indications. They, they were meant to tell a story for tribal people, 1400 years ago, they're not true. The kind of reaction that elicited from the mullahs of his time was a furious one. He was sentenced to death 5,555 5, times. I think that's a bit of an exaggeration, oh, yeah. but certainly, mm -hmm. the you know, he, he was ex extremely unpopular, but never, never, never is this ever expressed in Pakistani books. And Iqbal, well, 
I don't think there's one Allama Iqbal. I think there are two because, um, no, I'm not saying he's bipolar, but uh, his earlier one was uh, one of um, being uh, uh, friends with uh, all of India. And in fact, he wrote a poem in praise of Ram, which is not known to people, but it's there in his writings. He wrote, uh, Sare Jahan Se Achha Hindustan Hamara, something that was sung in India. Huh? And then he totally switched around. He flipped when he went to, to Cambridge and then he went to Germany. And he came back a very, very different man, full of um, ideas of Muslim greatness. And then that eventually turned into, uh, into his disliking uh, the Hindu way of life and so forth. And of course, I, I, I won't go into Jinnah because that will take us too long. Yeah, but what about Jinnah? I mean, you say that he had no business model when he actually you know, made this demand for <laughs> Pakistan. That he didn't have a business model. He didn't know what the state was going to be about. And you also point out that, you know, although people talk about, um, you know, the fact that he wanted a secular uh, country, he himself was not very sure about the kind of country he wanted. Can you say, I mean, can you summarize that in, in you know, very briefly? Yeah. Uh, look, uh, first of all, the myth in Pakistan is that Jinnah had a vision for the new state that was to be made, that he wanted it. Now, our liberals, our Pakistani liberals would like to believe that Jinnah wanted a secular democratic state. And indeed, that's what his 11th of August 1947 speech, which... Um, Every liberal in Pakistan seems to have memorized. That's quoted in defense. But on the other hand, if you look at Jinnah's other speeches, there he calls for, um, for an Islamic state, for the Sharia, and he uses the word Muslim state and uh, Islamic state interchangeably. Okay, so now when... Um, we have to ask, what is it that Jinnah really wanted? What is it that he thought Pakistan should be? Well, when he went to Aligarh, Aligarh University, he was asked this student, he, he was asked this question there by students. And this is 1945, 1946. And he tell them, look, you should not ask me this question. You should never ask me what is Pakistan to be. Anyone who asks me this question is an enemy of Pakistan. You know why he did that? Because if he committed to a socialist Pakistan or a capitalist Pakistan or a Islamic Pakistan, there'd be enemies of that point of view and uh, he'd break the entire Muslim consensus, which Jinnah formed around just one thing, that uh, we can't live with Hindus. We can't live with Hindus. We have to separate from them. So his, his answer to Aligarh students and to the Raja of Mahmudabad was, wait until we have a state. Wait until... We achieve Pakistan, and then you can ask, then you can make the country the kind of country that you want. So mm. <laughs> he never uh, he never said Pakistan has to be this or that. And sadly, our liberals, our Pakistani liberals, are still imagining that uh, Jinnah had a vision. So what is this then about the ideology of Pakistan? Uh, you go into that quite uh, deeply. So uh, tell us about that a bit. If, if yeah, there's a... Had no sorry. ideology as such. So what is this ideology of Pakistan? Whatever it is, if you speak against it, there's 10 years of prison. And if you want a job in, let's say, 
the state airlines, PIA, or in the steel mills, or in uh, a- a- any big government organization, you have to say that you believe in the ideology of Pakistan. Next question, what is the ideology of Pakistan? The problem is that it's not written down anywhere. There is no official document that says the ideology of Pakistan is dash, dash, dash. Except you will find it, what you will find, not in an official document, but in textbooks, also in books that prepare you for the civil service exams, is the ideology of Pakistan is Islam. All right, fine. <laughs> yeah, so but, what's, what's wrong about that? I mean, it it, it can oh, be Islam. Yeah, but Islam is not an ideology. Islam doesn't... Look, an ideology is a comprehensive set of doctrines that will tell you this is right and that is wrong. In particular, it will give you answers to big questions. So, for example, can the head of a Muslim state be a woman? Okay. Next question. Is the law of the land to be according to secular law, British law, as was given in 1947? Or is this to be a Sharia state? If it's to be a Sharia state, well, then you have to specify which brand of Sharia. There's Shafi, there's Maliki, there's Hanbali, there's uh, four of them. And then what do you do about the Shia? Because the Shia don't believe in any kind of Sharia. They have their own set of laws, but certainly not Sharia. So I, I could go on. Like, um, does the ideology of Pakistan forbid bank interest? Well, the whole economy here runs on interest. I, uh, if I don't get interest... And by the way, the interest rate these days is 22%. If I don't get 22%, at the end of the year, my 100 rupees will be worth uh, 70 rupees. That's because the inflation rate is uh, 30% around here. So 22%, if I don't get that, I'll be even 8% uh, poor. Does the ideology of... Pakistan forbid me from having slaves. Slaves are permitted by Islamic law. The ideology of Pakistan is not spelled out. It's ambiguous. And so, before I go to prison for opposing the ideology of Pakistan, I need to know what is it that I have violated. And it's not done. You've written a whole chapter questioning it. So... I don't know about you. How has your book been received in Pakistan so far? Oh, quite well. Um, people, the, the first uh, printing has been sold out. The okay. second one, uh, I think, is just reaching the bookstores. So it was published in uh, April, I think, April this year. It's doing pretty well. Uh, unfortunately, no university has uh, invited me for a book launch. And I have the a copy only of the book, book launches. I must show to ah. you. This is my copy. Ah, very nice, very nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it's been well received. That's good because history writing is very contentious in in Pakistan, and it has become like that in India as well. But from the beginning in Pakistan, uh, there's been, uh, you know, an official history, and nobody could contradict that. And you know, it was. Um, and you and your colleagues, um, um, Nair Saab, uh, you've all written so much about it. So it's a very contentious uh, subject, isn't it? And you've waded right into it. So which is why I asked you that question about uh, how it has been received. Um, in any case, I also felt that in uh, in many ways, as I was reading this book, that you were also uh, holding up a uh, a mirror to India. Is that, is my reading correct? I mean, is it, um, 
uh, you know, what lessons can Indians take away from your book? Is there something for Indians in this book? Look, I think it's not just for Indians, it's for everybody in every country of the world that we as citizens of a nation state are subject to manipulation by the government of that state, by the organs of that state, which seek to fashion our minds in very definite ways and seek to create a sense of patriotism. And in doing so, the uh, other peoples are denigrated to a lesser or to a greater degree. So I would say this is equally true for the United States, for Britain, which uh, celebrated its colonial history for a very long time. But now he's finally realizing that uh, it wasn't right. You see this in the United States where... Uh, you had Howard Zinn write the people's history of the United States and a gradual realization of how the Americans had wiped out the native Indians and so forth. Coming to India, I, we in Pakistan once used to look up to India as a kind of a model where, um, where there was a liberal, secular democratic approach to governance and to the writing of history. And so we said, wow, look, uh, they're pretty fair to their Muslims. And that was decades ago. But now we see that Muslims, of course, there are the marauders, they're the invaders, they're the looters, and they're the thugs and all that. Of course, that's true. Uh, if you have someone come and loot the Somnath temple, well, um, what would you call uh, Mahmoud Ghaznavi? Anything except as, um, as a looter, as a marauder. But there are those who stayed in India, became part of the soil, became part of Indian civilization, who built grand architectural monuments and uh, made India a beautiful place. Now, to say that they are intruders, they are foreigners, that's not true. Because the fact is, everyone's a foreigner. We're all children of the same African mother. We migrated. Every person everywhere on earth comes from common origins. That's and, a scientific uh, um, truth of it. That's a scientific thing. It's, it's uh, now a matter of genetics, of, um, uh, of uh, seeing how migration happened out of Africa some 100,000 years ago or so. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, you know, you, you're saying all this, but you're also saying that, you know, India can... Uh, never be a state like Pakistan. I mean, Pakistan right now today is uh, in in a crisis, is in yet another cycle of crisis. And uh, do you think that this goes back right to 1947 and the confusion in the, the ideology of Pakistan, the confusion in China's mind that you talk about, all this is, uh, you know, all that is happening today can be traced right back to that? I trace it even further back. I trace it to the coming of the British, and the British wanted people who could run the country for them. They needed people who could speak English, knew a bit of science, understood geography, looked at the world with modern eyes, and they needed modern people. Modernity was resisted by Hindus and by Muslims, but... Uh, Fortunately for Hindus, the reformist movements among Hindus, such as Brahmo Samaj, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, many others, those succeeded much better than the reformist movement of Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. And of course, you could say there's um, a history behind Muslim resistance to learning, Something happened in the 12th century. So look, if we look, if we 
study Muslim history between the 9th and the 13th century, Muslims were doing pretty good, pretty well. They were inventing new things. They were discovering new facts of nature. They were uh, experimenting around with, chemi with chemicals, with new medicines, uh, looking at the stars, all that, uh, inventing algebra and so forth. And that's because they were because of Greek injection into Muslim culture. Well, then the mullahs got all riled up and they chased the rationalists out. But look, the rationalists had managed to stay in Islam for 400 years. That's a good long time. Now, when that died out, Muslim civilization started to falter and started to rely more and more on brute force and less and less on thinking and discovering. So I'd say the roots go back to 1835 and a bit earlier than that. 1835 is the McCorder reforms. Uh, of course, <laughs> we uh, colonial subjects uh, bitterly resent that because yeah. the Hindus said, oh, we have our parchalas, we have our gurukulum, we have, uh, and, and the Muslims said, we have our uh, madrasas and we have our uh, traditional schools, maktabs. But those schools, both the Hindu and the Muslim, are entirely useless for this day and age. They are impediments to human progress. What we need to do, both India and Pakistan, is to catch up with the modern world. And India is doing it much better than Pakistan. And so if we can somehow weaken the mullah in Pakistan, I think uh, that is the way out. I don't see it happening, but that's the way out. That's a very daring thing to say, Dr. Hoodboy. And this discussion could go on, but time is running out. Dr. Hoodboy, thank you very much for being uh, on this show. And uh, if you're watching this uh, uh, interview, let me tell you that this is a very engaging uh, book. And um, thank you all for watching uh, South Asia Matters. Thank you. It was a pleasure.